Let's talk community, how to grow, nurture, engage, and measure. Welcome, Kim Mc McMahon. 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 I'll take that. <laughs> Thank you all for joining my talk. I'm not done yet. OK. Um, anyway, thank you all for joining my talk. As he mentioned, Kim McMahon, I know many of you in this room, long time open source, marketing, building community. You probably all, if people are like, I know her. I know her from somewhere. That will be Cloud Native Computing Foundation, where if your um, company was a member, I was hounding you to participate more. So anyway, uh, Rejects, thank you so much for having me speak today. Um, this is a great lineup of, of speakers. I'm really humbled to be part of all of them. And I always want to do a shout out to all, any, anybody who sponsored this event, because uh, for any of us who have worked in foundation and nonprofit and just trying to make, our, make enough money from an event to cover it, um, we can't do it without the sponsors. So thank you to the sponsors. Anyway, um, here we go. We're going to go on a journey together, and we're going to we're going to talk about software. We're going to talk about open source software and other software. We're going to talk about technology adoption. We're going to talk about using your software, helping somebody use your software before they buy anything. And we're going to talk about how we're building a community of users and contributors and advocates, what that means and what it takes. And we're also going to go on this journey in this community. We're going to focus on the users, while we also focus on what our organization needs. And yes, we can do both. So this, uh, this is why we're going to now talk about the elephant in the room. And this is the elephant in every community builder's room. We don't like him, but he, uh, she, she's because she's pink. Um, companies are in the, we're, we're going to talk frankly, companies are in the business to make money. And they do give back, and as with the company that, the last couple companies I worked for, they gave back a lot. You know, they have a lot of open source contributors, they donate to foundations, they sponsor events, for example, so they do give back. But at the end of the day, that company, my company needed to make money. They needed to drive revenue. And if they don't drive revenue, then they don't have money to help develop new technologies, which is the open source engineers, or the marketing resources and community resources for awareness of projects, um, helping users get started and contribute, for example, or providing user support. And if we don't see that path from open source or free usage into paid usage, jobs start going away, as we all know uh, recently here. And a lot of those are the marketing community jobs. And some of you might be saying, well, yay, you know, we don't really like marketing and community people anyway because they're always trying to sell us something. But I'm going to say no, you're, you're wrong with that because there are many of us in this industry, some of them in this room, who, who know how to do that, who know how to do it right where we respect the privacy of the individuals who we are trying to get information in front of. We understand your processes. We know what it is that you're trying to do. And we're never going to sell you anything. And you really do want more of us around. You want more people like that around. And where we're focused on the end-to-end -end user experience. So now I'm going to do another little pivot. And that's actually product-led growth, kind of in a nutshell. So we're digging a little deeper into that PLG model. And I do want to be clear. Um, I do not believe, nor am I ever going to support, that open source software was, is around to, develop, to drive into product usage and drive revenue for a company. That's not why open source was created. But it, it has a set of benefits that uh, many of us who are in open, open source, we all know and we live by things like transparency and collaboration, inclusivity and community. And then you get, you know, open source, you get those those benefits of shared innovation and adoption, resources, improved sta sta reliability. And, and with that, the goals of an open source project are to be bringing in users and to get contributors. Um, and bringing in the users at the open source software level is a, very, is a great first step to give people that hands-on experience with your technology. And the benefit to the project, the more users you have, then maybe you have contributors, and you could be driving your open source project through the different maturity levels. So free and beer or as a puppy, puppy picture number one. Um, 
So you have a, so the, you, know, you know, take any open source project, we're at KubeCon, so we can say Kubernetes. It, they, they live as part of a foundation who's providing a set of benefits, you know, the oversight and, and um, resources in some cases, governance. But there's a whole set of open source projects that I just call it, they're just out there, right? They're not part of a foundation. Um, they're likely either somebody who is just developing on the project, uh, similar to the BioDrop app that I've been showing a lot of you, or, or a corporation who has an open source project. So for simplicity's sake, um, we have our users of the project and we have contributors to the projects, um, and, but, and they are individuals, hobbyists, but they're likely part of a company who has an interest in that, in, in that open source technology. And that company is making an investment in that technology through their employees doing their open source stuff. And, but they're also making an investment through, as I mentioned, um, foundations and, and sponsoring events. And this is that cycle that is building, the, you know, cycle feeding this whole open source project and this whole open source industry. Corporations are consuming the technology, but they're also giving back. And then they're going to go ahead and they're going to wrap services around those technologies so that they can sell, which then they have money, blah, 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 blah. We already got pat went through how marketing people go away when that doesn't happen. Kidding. Anyway, how this relates back to product-led growth. So we, this is a flywheel. And if you haven't seen this product-led growth, it, it, it really... I was, um, I was doing, I kept hearing this word last year about this time. I kept hearing this PLG word. And I'm like, what is this PLG thing? Like, I had not, I've been in, working for the foundation in an open source for so long, I hadn't really heard what that was. So I started Googling. I'm like, this is what we are doing here in open source. So this whole flywheel here is taking everybody on this journey from activation, to, you know, trying out the project, to adopting it, bringing it into production, to loving it and advocating for it. And how we are helping people do that from a community standpoint is through events and digital things, you know, events like KCDs and, and of course, uh, rejects here, through our digital activities on social media platforms and Slack, supporting people on Slack, for example, by providing the high value content and helping drive people into that open source adoption. Um, and as we do that, so now we're getting into the community stuff. I, we, as, as community managers or DevRel, any of these roles that we're helping people with the technology, we need to continue, make sure that we're, we're doing this with our open source tenets of integrity and respect and open, openness and transparency with collaboration, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, Let's see. Oh, and, and when we do that, we take people on this journey through content and through transparency that helps them figure out, helps the user figure out what is right for them. So if the open source version is working great, fine, that's, that's awesome. But do they need additional services or features or they just don't want to manage it themselves? Then, then through this community process, and through our content, we're helping you realize as a user when you are ready to go ahead and make that purchase. And when you're ready to make that purchase, we're there to help put you in contact with the right people to make that a seamless, a seamless process. And where this is different, where PLG is different and coming from the bottoms up, and where open source is different and coming from the bottoms up, is we're helping you with that process without selling to you. And many organizations, you know, they have their tops down and they're going to continue doing that. But what's important with community building is it is all bottoms up, helping you realize what's right for you. Now, if you're going to, when you're going to build a community, you need to define your why, and there's a whole lot of reasons that you may want to build a community, whether it's customer support, you want awareness, you're looking for brand recognition for your organization, you're trying to bring people together, recruiting, whatever it is. Like, we all know the whole reasons why, we, why you would build a community. But the important thing is, is that you need to know why you're doing, why you specifically are doing it. Like, you're not going to do it for all of these things. You're going to do it for maybe a couple of these things. Because you, you, you really can't 
effectively do it for all these things, especially when you're starting early in community building. And even after you have started this in community building and you've maybe said, well, I really want to get more users, so I'm going to get more awareness for my project, then you're going to kind of move on to another one of these things within building your community uh, that makes sense for where your community is. And the other thing that we need to make sure when we're building this community is when you define your why, know why your organization wants you to do this. What is it that they are trying to accomplish? Is it a certain number of users? You know, you really need to be tying your community efforts back into your organizational goals. Um, because when you don't, you really can't, you can't prove your community efforts and DevRel efforts are making a difference if you don't if you're not doing something that your organization is seeing as a success. So there, there is a caveat that, um, and I've had a past job like this, where, they, where your or leadership may ask you to do something in your community building and DevRel efforts that are not within those, those open source tenets. And that's where it's your responsibility to step back from that, educate your leadership, and tell them that that's it's not right. It's not the right way to go about it. We can go about it another way to accomplish your goals. So just because your leadership says, go out there and grab all those leads from KubeCon, mine that database, or, or give them out to our sales reps to sell to, you can step up and say no. And there's a more thoughtful way that we can go ahead and help drive those names that we've gathered at KubeCon into our product use. So I have a couple um, examples. And these are, exa uh, these are real organizations. Uh, I don't name their names or anything, because uh, I don't want to. And, um, but w I'm going to give you a couple of examples of community building. And the reason, we'll go back here for a minute. Um, and the reason I wanted to share some examples, because you can start identifying where maybe you or your organization or your team is in maybe building your community or getting more users or getting more contributors. And hopefully this will give you some ideas that you can take back. So this first example is an organization, is a, is a large corporation that had purchased smaller companies um, that had open source projects. And with many acquisitions, when that happens, um, a lot of assets, and in this example, the community, the assets just kind of got lost. So. They, they then decided, they said, well, wait, they had a big community, have a large number of users. How can we reinvigorate the community here? But their leadership really didn't know what they wanted to do or what they were trying to accomplish or what that really meant. So these community managers uh, went and said, well, how about let's provide something of value back to the organization that we don't have. And in this case, it was pro providing user feedback on the product and on the projects. So... And they, and they knew that they had gaps like in documentation and user journeys to fill and they thought that by talking to them they could, they could un understand how that journey was and see if they can improve it and increase adoption. So it was very simple, talk to users, give feedback to product management and put in requests for improvement on documentation and um, different steps along that user journey. So they looked at just one very easy thing that they could fix. Um, and I put a couple of quotes on the, up there but, uh, that I always, uh, when they share that with their leadership, um, I, th these quotes were just so valuable to their leadership. Uh, when you start hearing users say secret sauce, like you can never tell your v VP of marketing to never say secret sauce, but when your user says it makes you look ridiculous, they start listening. So the second one is a community. They had an open source project that was at the stage of crossing the chasm. And they knew the technology was good, it was sound, it worked. But a lot of people were, a lot of users were reluctant to use it in their production environments because it just wasn't proven. They didn't feel like it was proven. So what they decided, their marketing and community resources said, well, I think we need to spend some time proving out this technology. And they did this through end user case studies by talking to end users, how they were using it, and what kind of results that they got in, they saw in their environment when they were using it. 
such as you know improved reliability, decreased latency, et cetera, et cetera. And they wrote up these case studies. They created snackables, tiles. They promoted it. They helped get those speakers at events such as a KubeCon like this or a Regex to be talking about the benefits they got from using that technology. And then they took it a step further and and talked to, and brought the, started bringing the, them together to talk about how they were using the technology and how they could provide more feedback back to the project on what was really important to them, as, as opposed to engineers and maintainers from companies directing the open source project, the, give, getting the users together to direct the direction of the open source project. And my third example is of an established open source community. And um, they, uh, they're, they're, they were a long time established, um, drama free community. Their goal was focused on driving adoption and showing how easy it was to use the technology, their open source version. And then if the user was ready for that enhanced support, how easy it was for them to make the decision themselves and to make that conversion from open source into subscription. So they were not working on this part of it. They were staying at the top, they had typically stayed at the top of funnel just with education, for example, but they wanted to move down into the middle of the funnel. And they did this through an education, educational product. So they offered a set of education on how to use this open source project, and then how to use this open source project in, your, in the environment which, which the product was. So they believed um, in this adoption-led strategy model that if you could get people understanding how to use something complicated like Kubernetes it, it, with their open source tools, that then when they were ready in, to move into the product, they made that seamless and easy for them to do. And my last slide, um, so what I want to really stress to you is that when you're looking at building your community, it doesn't have to be a grand plan from nothing to everything. You know, take a look at where you are, what you're trying to accomplish, and just do something. Just take just take one of those initial steps. And when, they are, when you finish those steps are up, then go ahead and move on to the next thing that's going to help your community grow and help meet your organizational goals. So, I, and I do want to stress that as community leaders and DevRel people, I know we have a lot of DevRel and Dev Advocates here in this room, our job should not, and it does not have to be, and should not be about driving revenue. Our job should be about supporting the users of our technology and providing what they need, whether it's learning or getting started, or providing a platform for them to shine, such as presenting at an event, for their voice to be heard, and to be part of the community. But again, you need to come make sure that you've aligned it, the scary part, back to your organizational goals. So with that, I'm done, and that's my princess. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, in the last slide where you talked about like uh, about the, uh, my question is how do you measure? What's the metric? And uh, you know, especially especially when the project is new and when you are trying to prove it to your management or whoever, it's not productized yet or whatever. So how do you justify it? So it's going to depend on what your leadership, what your leadership goals are. Like, what what are their goals? Is it X number, X dollar amount of revenue? Is it X number of users? Um, or are they? Do they believe that if you have 
if you grow your community members by 20%, that's success. So when you know what their success is, you can align your activities and then report your success based on what they see as successful. So do you have an example of one of your leadership goals? You don't have. He, he, he has no examples. <laughs> but, yeah, so um, a lot of them are going to be, um, a lot of them are going to be revenue, right? So, I mean, um, um, if we're working for a for-profit corporation, it's going to be revenue. And so if, if I, depending on the maturity of your community, let's say you have, um, a, you, you at least have a Slack community and you, going on, you got people talking out there and you have a handful of users of your open source project. So what you're going to want to try to do is measure as best you can the users of those open source projects as they move down in, into your, your funnel. So your success could be more open source users and then it could be more contributors and then, uh, then you want to try to somehow measure with hopefully, if you have a good um, CRM, measure when those users move from open source into product. But we, it, it's, the other, it, it, well, it, the hard part, it, no, it's not hard. The hard part is, is that there's not one answer that fits all. Because it depends on what your organization is going to find important and where you currently are. So if you had an example, yeah, um, then, yeah. Ralph, oh, you need this. So one of the problems we have, for example, at our company, by the way, I work for Microsoft, so it's a megacorp looking for the funnel kind of experience, you know, sort of thing. Um, but I work in the open source part, and, and my critical thing is the growth of the ecosystem. And the assumption is that, uh, you know, if we're doing our job right and services support the stuff, that in fact there will be a funnel. So but you, when you talk about a funnel, you talk about tracking people moving from open source into the, into the corporate funnel. Where's the boundary for you from that perspective or in this kind of from different communities and so forth between, hey, the ecosystem is growing, so that part is fantastic, but then there's this cutoff between the ecosystem and the telemetry or so forth between that and the funnel is generating more revenue. How, how do you think about that? Well, so Ralph and um, the rest of the Microsoft people, as well as anybody, if we have any Google or AWS people, you all are really lucky because your organizations are funding open source. Um, Solo's funding open source, right? So you're, you are really lucky with that. And, and so in your case, Ralph, uh, we'll get to your funnel question in a second, but in your case, you, you probably have set saying, I need to grow, I need to have this many contributors, or I need to have this diversity of contributors who are not all Microsoft employees. And that is a measure of success. And there are tools out there. So if you're not um, familiar with Chaos, which is one of the Linux Foundation projects, they have a lot of tools to help you measure that. Of course, Biturgia, and I don't know if they're going to be here at this event, they have tools that will help you measure um, how many new users, how many new contributors, are they all from your company as best as they can figure that out. Actually, there's another uh, great tool, Common Room, who also helps figure out who people are, even though you know a lot of our GitHubs are with our own personal email addresses. So in a, in a case like that with a big organization, they have a mandate to grow the community and continue with their open source, with awareness of, of them doing open source things. And they do that by showing that they are contributing themselves as well as growing contributors from other organizations. Now, as people, so how, how we were going to do it at Cisco, and I say we were, uh, at, I believe that they're going to implement this, is when we go to something like a KubeCon, this is a developer event and we're not selling. And they go, in, if, they, if I've had a conversation with them, they get marked in our CRM system as a community-led lead. And then if they eventually buy something, then that will show that their initial touch into any of our open source projects or our free version was via this community. I think we called it, a, I think we're going to call it a community lead. 
And that's how we track them. Now, I'm not selling to them. I'm using these, these people in the database, and I'm providing information to them on a periodic level, white paper, opportunity to listen to a webinar, come and do a hackathon, come join us for a hands-on lab. I'm providing them opportunities that, to learn. That's all I'm doing. I'm not, I'm not ever saying, hey, did you know that you should look at, at this other product? They will find that out as I'm providing them with opportunities to learn how to use the technology. Did that answer it? Kind of? It, and it is really hard, and that's why a lot of organizations, you're, as we're seeing right now, I mean, this is a difficult time in tech. As we're seeing right now, there's a lot of organizations that are cutting back on their community and DevRel people because they're not seeing the value. And um, and I, I'll i be talking more to Dawn, Dr. Dawn Foster on this. It's like, we've got to figure out how we can show the value of community activities, right? And again, I, I showed a couple of examples where what, what's important to my SVP? Not what's important to my manager, what's important to my SVP? And try to put my, the activities I'm doing in something that they care about. So uh, my another question is, uh, more than question, like you, you talked about the virtuous cycle of how, you know, uh, company, companies get involved and then they use the project and then it's it's helping the whole ecosystem. But I think the cynical side of it is like, the other side is this project is super successful for whatever reasons. If you don't get involved, you're losing out because you may lose potential customers who will ask for this project on your platform. And so sometimes companies are also involved because uh, they may not be able to drive the decision of that project because it may not, if, if the project takes a different decision and it, it's not aligning with their company's goals, so, you know. So sometimes companies could be there because they want to control the direction of the project, right? Did you just say some companies do open source so they can control the technology? <laughs> um, yes, um, they are, and I was... Um, having a conversation with uh, somebody here at this event a little earlier that yes, there are companies that will want to control the open source project, but as soon as you try to control it, one, we all know who they are and what they're doing. I mean, we, if you've been in open source any amount of time, we know you're doing that and we can tell um, because you've lost your transparency. Um, all your contributors are from the company. You're not open to any other contributions and um, let's just say you get rid of your community, open source community person, right? Like, you're not serious about doing your open source in a transparent manner that engages the community. So, um, people who are true to open source, we can tell. So, yeah, so don't do that. Don't try to control the project. <laughs> all right, that's all we have time for. So, thanks. Thanks, Kim.